Christopher is an actively exhibiting artist teaching fine art photography at Utah State University. He holds an MFA from Ohio University in photography and received a BA from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. His work can be found in the permanent collections of the Mississippi Museum of Art, Webster University, the Netherlands, Kosovo Airport, Russian Federation, and in private collections nationally and internationally. Autism advocacy became a personal imperative when he became aware of the link between his environmental concerns and his children's autism. Christopher's wife, Jacqueline, is Jackie, oh, she signed in here, okay. Uh, Jacqueline, she's with the kids, um, is a collaborative partner in the photographic project Evidence and Artifacts Facing Autism. The photos that are exhibited on the walls in the general session here in the Summit Ballroom are part of the Evidence and Artifacts Facing Autism project. Christopher and Jacqueline Gauthier live with their family in Logan, Utah. Jay Lynn, we introduced um, on our right, Michael McMahon, if you weren't here yesterday, Dr. McMahon, McMahonman, I'm sorry. Uh, um, sorry, Michael. Um, he attended the University of Kansas for his master's in human development and obtained his doctorate in special education from the University of Nevada. Subsequently, he was licensed as a psychologist by the state of Massachusetts. He also founded the Berkshire Center in 1984. Uh, he has an inside perspective as he himself was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and grew up in a very large family with several individuals on the spectrum. Dr. McManman also serves on the U.S. Autism and Asperger's Association Advisory Board. Then on the far right to me is Eric Peacock. Now he's a graduate of Stanford Graduate School of Business and Harvard College. Um, Eric and I um, will be meeting on the uh, field in battle tonight as Stanford plays the University of Southern California. So that game starts at 5 o'clock on ABC. Anyway. <laughs> Any USC fans? Uh, oh, we're in Washington. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, it should be a great game. Um, I talked to uh, Eric about four months ago or so, I believe, and uh, told me about um, this project that he's going to be discussing called My Autism Team. Uh, he's the general manager of My Autism Team, and it's a, a site where parents of children with autism go to find and recommend great autism providers for their kids and to connect with other parents like them. I've never seen anything like this before. It is absolutely wonderful, and he will explain um, this in just a few minutes. Uh, Eric's first introduction to autism spectrum came seven years ago when his nephew was diagnosed with Asperger's, and the child of a very close friend was also diagnosed with PDD-NOS. So these events got Eric interested in using the web to help connect parents in the autism community and share knowledge. So now I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Teresa, and uh, we're going to go ahead and, and, and start with this. Thanks, Larry. Well, Eric, I know that we have your uh, a computer hooked up here so we can demonstrate a little bit about my autism team. Before we take off, come, come on up and prop, please. Um, I want to explain how the panel works. Uh, for those of you who maybe are just walking in, we're going to do a quick five-minute introductions. Eric, this will be yours. And tell us a little bit about what you do in the community, uh, how you support our population, and so on. And then we'll break out into three-minute questions, and you'll be timed. Please watch for Gail in front when she holds up the one-minute banner. You've got one minute left on your answer. Um, and just try to crystallize your, your answers to the questions that are posed. Thanks. All right, well, thank you very much for being here, uh, for having me here, I should say. Um, it's quite an honor to be a, you know, internet guy from Silicon Valley and be able to come talk to all of you. I, uh, you know a lot more about autism than I do. But I do know that when my brother and, uh, and his wife went through the process of figuring out how to get their son, who was diagnosed on the spectrum, 
the right providers to help them it was something that i've heard echoed by many many other parents sense it was lonely it was frustrating and it was like quote reinventing the wheel and as an internet guy that drove me nuts so i did what any other self respecting internet guy would do and took my whole team off our current company and built this site so i hope you like it so this is called my autism team and as larry said my autism team is a place for parents of children with autism to connect with each other find someone who's been in their shoes and actually share recommendations of great local providers, the whole spectrum of providers, which I'll show you, um, but also just to offer each other tips and support. And what I'd like to do is uh, just give you a live demo of it. Um, and uh, the way I think I'll do that is show you uh, an actual parent on the site. And what I'm going to just preface this with is say, we launched this site four and a half months ago with 30 parents in the San Francisco Bay Area. It now has, as of just now, 10,700 parents on it in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. I think we've touched on something, which is really, really great. And so I want to show you an example of what one of these parents can do and what you can do when you come on the site. This is Sharon uh, from Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's a wonderful mom of a five-year-old boy with Asperger's who's verbal. His name's Adam. He's also pictured there. And when you join my autism team, we ask you these basic profile questions because one thing we know is that the spectrum is very wide. And so what she recommends or what she says worked for her child will only, may not work for yours. So you can get this basic information and search for parents that way. You then probably want to learn a little bit more about Sharon. And in this case, you can read her story. And th these are places where she asks and answers basic questions like, what's your typical day like? When did you know your child was on the spectrum? Very importantly, what therapies, if any, have worked? And what do you wish you knew then that you know now? When people read these things, it sparks a lot of conversations. And I'll show you how that, that gets played out later. But then there is the centerpiece, and that is her team. Now, an autism team is all of the providers you've assembled as a parent, often through trial and error, this case over two years for Sharon, uh, to help your child thrive. And you can see she has 21 people on her autism team. And you may go, I don't have 21 people, but I'll bet you do if you see her team. Now, it starts with, you know, up top here, I don't know if you can see that, but her, her pediatric dentist and her doctor. And if you scroll down a little bit, you see there's the OTs and the, the speech pathologists and, the, and, and uh, uh, occupational therapists, right? And then as you keep going on, you start to see all the other things that any child needs in development. These ones just happen to be autism-friendly providers of gymnastics, of music school. Uh, my favorite is kids jungle cuts right here. You know, it's a barber who she describes as being really patient with her child. This is gold, right? If you're a parent whose child has been diagnosed and you live in Albuquerque, New Mexico near her, this might save you like a year of going through this stupid process of reinventing the wheel. And that was really what our goal was, just you don't have to be alone and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So naturally, you might be interested perhaps in, uh, in, in one of these businesses. If, if you live there, I clicked on the Albuquerque Gymnastic School. And here is kind of where, where the Yelp aspect of this site comes in. You know, allowing you to know what the local provider is. And in this case, you know, you can see she's actually said, after two months of gymnastics, we saw a dramatic improvement in Adam's gross motor skills and his self-confidence. That's a review. It's a first-hand review from her. It gives you some, you know, kind of inside perspective on what she found with that. Naturally, that may lead you to, to want to ask her a question. You can just come here and click on Sharon, and this is where the Facebook element comes in. This is her wall. You can see she posted about two hours ago. God bless you, Sharon, for doing that. Um, you, you, can go, you can go right on here and post a message to Sharon, and she can answer you. And when we implemented this part of the, the site, it just took off. I mean, people do this all day long and have these conversations, and it turns into really kind of amazing um, Q&A. And so that naturally leads you to, to kind of two things. What you've just seen is an example of what one parent can provide. But when you have 10,000 parents all across the United States doing this, you start to build a huge database of providers. We have over 30,000 autism-friendly providers on the site now, and it's growing every day because parents like you add them. Um, and we also partnered with uh, Autism Speaks and took their whole database in from the get-go. And you also build a huge database of parents. So here's our aptly named Find Parents uh, tab. And you can see there are 10,585 now. Um, and you can sort this. You could go in here and say, you know, your zip code and have it narrow down to that. If you want to find parents who have a child who is an adult, you could do that. If you want to check by diagnosis, you could do that. 
you know, I'll just click on the one that says adult um, and uh, hope that the Wi-Fi comes through for me here. Um, what's interesting about this is there is a local nature to this and there is a national nature to this. And here, you know, there's 770 parents on the site already who have adults. These are the people hacking that machete through the jungle, um, you know, paving the way for everyone else. And hopefully, if we can use a site like this to really um, bring that knowledge and share that wisdom on one site so it makes life easier for all of you, we've achieved our mission. I think I've run out of time, so I'll, I'll stop. Thanks. <laughs> Well, as a parent, I can really appreciate that because I, I'm, my daughter's 21. It took a long time to figure out who was really skilled, who already was treating children um, and had experience in autism, so I didn't have to train them before they could help my daughter. So thanks for doing that. Okay, um, let's start down here. We'll start here with Christopher. Um, why don't you uh, give us five minutes, five minute, five minute synopsis of how you support the community, your goals, that, that sort of thing. Well, I can tell you that my students would say me talking in five minutes is almost impossible. It's <laughs> much longer than that usually. Um, evidence and artifacts began actually as an environmental impact project. Um, there's a component to it that's called Particle Matter 2.5, <laughs> which specifically deals with air quality issues in the Cache Valley. Um, our air quality is, is equal and in some cases rivals Los Angeles' pollution. And <clears throat> living in that kind of toxic soup for short bursts of time made me start to scratch my head and again look at my own life and look at the lives around me and the community that was around me. Utah has a very, very large autism population. Uh, recent numbers came out from um, the University of Utah, Judith Zimmerman, whose photograph is right here, that puts boys at one in 49. And that data is two years old because they forced her to sit on the information. So she's actually got data that's much worse than that at this point. Being an environmentalist, I scratched my head and you know, I'm trying to figure out the patterns of things like all of you are trying to figure out the patterns to things. Why is this happening? What is causing this? Well, by default, I'm an, I'm an ecologist. The other side of it is I have a child, actually two children who are on spectrum. And as an artist, the work is usually about us. It's about our own narratives. And so in a moment of frustration, in a battle period with my daughter, and she, I jokingly call her my African honey badger, uh, she's small, she's fuzzy, she's cute, everybody loves her, but when the claws and the, and the teeth come out, she'll take on a pack of lions, you know? I mean, she's ferocious. And I love her to bits. And so we're literally in the middle of this argument, this battle, and I thought, okay, this is it. I have got to make a photograph about this. I don't know how to do it. I'm just going to do it. So I set it up, and I shot the portrait of the little girl in the sleepy PJs down here. That's the first image. The second image is of me barely restraining my irritation on the fact that she was still on the other side of the camera antagonizing me because she knew she could do it. And as that grew, I realized this is not an unusual situation. Everybody around me is facing the same thing. This is ridiculous. Why are, we, why are we feeling alone? Why are we struggling? How can I reach to my, my neighbors and my friends, the therapists that all feel the same way? They're all frustrated. You are all frustrated. And so we began this very, 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 very long endeavor. The project's goal is over 5,000 portraits. It will take me over five years to do it. I will not stop. I was the kid who grew up with no diagnosis I'm an undiagnosed Asperger's, and I refuse to do it because of institutional discrimination. I grew up in the 70s, one of the oddballs, and I have fought and struggled my way. I was, quote, the dumb one of the family, and I'm the only one with a higher education degree at this point. <laughs> so, you know, drive is a good thing. The goal of this, I gain nothing from this. In fact, it is entirely self-funded. The goal of this is to become a political movement, to create an iconic image, not one image like Dorothea Lange's migrant mother image from the, you know, from the Great Depression, but a collection of faces that no politician can walk away from, no human being can walk away from. You cannot not feel like you're being seen by these eyes. 
by the, the people who have autism, by the parents who are struggling with it on a daily basis, you in the room, by the clinicians, by the teachers, by the therapists, by every single human being who struggles and fights on a daily basis on the front lines of autism. We have to move forward. This is a new time. The, the, the crew who have moved before us, Jalen, these, these, you know, you mentioned the machete running through the forest or through the jungle. It's absolutely true. But there is such massive growth right now. We hold, we are the constituency. The politicians cannot ignore us if we stand together. Last thing, I got the one minute flag. I was recently told by a Utah representative who I spoke with in a parking lot after an autism meeting that the Utah representatives are terrified of the subject of autism. Quote, terrified because it is not quantifiable, qualifiable. We cannot give them an exact number on how to cure it, solve it, fix it, or anything. And they don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Well, he said that to the wrong person. <laughs> we need to stick the 10-foot pole right in front of them. And I'm asking you to be part of that. Um, if you're interested in participating in the project, please contact us. Um, we are looking for grassroots connections. That is what makes it, this really happen. So I'm looking to spread this out. We're gonna be going to Europe this summer. I'll be photographing in Germany. I'm negotiating for England, and I think my time might be up. Okay, thank you very much. We're not quite that strict. If you wanted to say one more little thing, I hate to cut people off oh, in the middle of a sentence. I'll give you, you the, good? I'll give you the tagline at the end that I love so okay. much. Okay, cool, all right. All right, uh, Michael, do you want to give us five minutes? Sure. I can hopefully stop at that five minutes, right? So um, I wanted to thank um, Chris for documenting what's going on in the autism community because that's we need documentation, we need communication, Eric, and we need organization from Jay Lynn. And that's how we're going to get where we need to go. Uh, college internship program, which is my baby, for 28 years uh, with our six centers around the country. Um, it only fills one portion of the gap and it's only for certain families. And um, we can't do everything to everyone. And we've been, you know, anyone who's any good in the field right now has too much work. And that's what's happening with Steven and everyone else at the conference. We're just overwhelmed. And so we've had all kinds of offers to do all kinds of things and we just keep true to our mission and say, no, just do what you're doing, which is comprehensive college and careers for this particular segment. And they're, you know, uh, high-functioning autism and Asperger's and LD kids between 18 and 26. And that's what we do. And so our calling card is our comprehensive curriculum, which is um, when I got diagnosed eight, ten years ago, whatever it is now, by my staff, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they get it. But they, um, I, uh, I, my special interest became the curriculum because I thought, well, is there a way that we can cut through so that kids aren't coming into our program and not getting who they really are by the time they leave? You know, because if we can, you know, part of my Asperger's is efficiency, you know. I like to be efficient. I like to use my time, everything right, and I don't waste, and I, you know, et cetera. So, um, uh, parents are paying a lot of money for our programs. They're expensive, and um, it's uh, not, you know, in California, the, the regional centers do provide funding for the tuition, but they're cutting back now, too. Of course, they don't have any money. So it's, uh, it's a problem, and um, I wish it could be free for everyone, and my, my retirement, which will never be, but my next 20 years will be working for my foundation, which is a student educational development fund, and like, similar to what Jalen's doing on a different level. What we're working on is um, three areas. Tuition assistance for our students to attend programs like ours, and that's one area. And then the other one is professional conferences and seminars around the country, which we do uh, near all of our centers. And, uh, and then the third one is the, uh, the development and encouragement of uh, visual and performing arts and for our students, because we noticed that uh, I was talking down to the platypus people down there. <laughs> I don't know if he's here or not. But the, uh, they're working on, you know, IT, computer, video gaming, and everything. So we have, um, because I'm the, 
I guess the CEO, it says in here, which is really not in the founder, but because I, it all comes through me um, and being an Aspie, I can move the resources where I want to. And so what I've done in the last two years is um, we were going to upgrade all of our computers at all of our centers, and we did an inventory. I said, don't give the advisors and the academic tutors these great computers. Give them the old computers so they can just do email, which is all they do anyway. And let's do computer labs that are state of the art for the students so they can do video program, video games, films, you know. So that's how we used our resources there instead. And then uh, we, we did the same thing with the visual performing arts. So I said, let's, I, what had, I don't know where I am with time, but I was in Florida, two minutes, okay, great. So I was in Florida in last uh, about two winters ago, and I w in the middle of the night I woke up and I started to, and I thought I could have an art gallery because I was renovating this old 1865 building into new offices and stores and stuff. And I said I could have an art gallery. I started to cry because it was my special interest since I was like four years old. And I thought, wow, this would be awesome. And then that whole project developed into an art gallery called Good Purpose Gallery a, a student-run um, organic crepery called Starvis Ar Starving Artist Cafe. And then while we were doing that project, the state came along, the town was able to build a parking lot behind it, and then we bought this church right behind it and made it into a Spectrum Playhouse, and then the um, Joyous Studios for doing mentor. We have a, a local artist mentoring our students and a community center. And we put this whole project together, and. Um, it's just awesome, and it's uh, all the students are just all over it, and so I realized that we need to get them working. We need to get them things. So the primary emphasis for us now is connecting the college with employment, and um, employment's got to be the focus: social skills, employment, executive functioning, sensory integration, all those things together. You can't ignore life skills or budgeting. You can't. You have to do the those four or five things at the same time, and you have to start early. Was that my warning bell? Okay, so what does that mean? Oh, it's my end bell. Okay, I'm over then. <laughs> You're such a good sport. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you other chances though to talk, so it's all good. <laughs> Okay, so let's start in our three-minute panel questions. And the first one I wanted to throw out actually is to you, Eric. Um, having put together different things for the autism community myself, and then also having a, a daughter on the spectrum, um, I, I look at what you've put together in terms of this model, and it, it's, it's totally wonderful because this is really gonna save a lot of time for parents. But when you use Facebook and, you, and we're on the internet, there's information available to people who aren't so nice. And I'm talking about predators. When parents put their information out there, it's a track to their kids. And, I, and it's a big deal on Facebook. How, how are you um, protecting the parents and the kids from being identified? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I'd say there's a couple things to think about. Just like on Facebook, you know, you shouldn't put stuff on there that you don't want to share because people will see it. And I think we've all heard that and know that enough. Um, one of the reasons we made this just for the autism community is because uh, parents often describe it as saying, like, I got plenty of friends on Facebook, but I, I don't necessarily think that they're going to understand what I'm really going through. I'd much rather share in a community that's safer where people understand what, is, you know, what I'm dealing with. They've been in my shoes. At the same time, we very much believe that openness is critical. That's the way you harness the wisdom of, of this crowd and of this community. So we built the site specifically for the autism community, for parents in the autism community. And what you share on that site is what is seen. It is available and it is open. Now, we never, we never share your email address. We, never, we don't ask for your address. Um, so people can know, though, you know, what city you live in. It's up to you to decide whether you use your own name, whether you include a photo, that's all your choice. Um, everything that's put on there is your choice. And then of course, we never post the things that you put on the site on Facebook. We don't do that, it stays on the site there. If you decide you wanna share it, that's, that's your choice. But again, it's put, the, put it in the hands of the people using it. And then finally, you know, we have people on our team who monitor and watch things, but we're growing so fast, we're finding that the community is a, the best monitor possible. 
and it's formed, it, it's kind of turned into a really just lovely environment where people are sharing some wonderful things. Okay, thanks. That was very short. Your time actually wasn't up. I think we have a wonky buzzer down there. <laughs> Did you feel like you got to say everything you wanted to? Super. Okay. Um, my next question, I wanted to ask you, Jalen. Uh, I have a daughter, 21 on the spectrum, and housing is <laughs> housing is a huge, huge issue. She's not quite ready. We're working on transition skills, but when she's ready, there's a lack of, of facilities out there. There's a lack of funding. Um, we're trying to kind of patchwork something together. What would you say to parents who have put this off or who know it's been coming and it's been very difficult to patchwork together? How, how, do, you, how, does, how do you help us with that? I think there are a number of ways that uh, we can start looking at things locally. Uh, whether you want to partner with other parents that you know and maybe look at buying a home that would belong to you as a group or belong to your child and have others living in it and paying rent and doing different types of things that would be a, a private ownership. Right now we've got a lot of incredible organizations that own homes and provide services. Uh, we may need to have more parents stepping forward uh, to having their own ownership and including others in on that process. There's something that I'm quite fascinated with. There's a project in Maryland right now uh, where um, a fellow that had worked with Sunrise for a number of years is putting together a situation where there would be 16 co-op apartments. So a family could purchase an apartment in an environment that would be um, homogeneous. Now, it wouldn't be just those on the spectrum, but hopefully an environment where people have maybe been out coping with uh, the rest of us all day long and they want to come home and not have to deal with trying to please others, that they want to take a deep breath and be in their own space, but then to have the protection that is necessary for many of our children because they may not make wise decisions as far as going out and going to 7-Eleven and not being picked up by somebody in a car if they're doing something independent. Now, where people have those skills and abilities, yes. Uh, have situations where we can have as much freedom as possible, but where someone needs to be protected and have freedom, I think we need to look within our communities and look at solutions we've never thought of before and maybe get some of our other parents together to start talking about this because it's, it's like so many things. Think globally, act locally. Thank you. Christopher, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the pictures. Um, to me, it humanizes the large issue facing our country. Uh, it, the incidence is only going up. And you want this to be a grassroots um, issue. So in taking the pictures, and can you, can you kind of crystallize for us when you say grassroots effort? Do you, do you have specific goals? Um, that you're going to put behind it? Or is it a, more of a motivational, inspirational to wake people up? Could you give us a little bit more? Microphones are always fun. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I think it is, it is about your interactions, you as an individual coming together. As Jalen pointed out, there was the hierarchy of individual, community, national. Um, being a professor, I have access to the researchers. I have access to the politicians. You know, I just have to, you know, flash on my credentials and the doors open up pretty easily. I found it to be rather remarkable, actually. Uh, but that's not where I come from. Where I come from is the grassroots social movements. Before Utah, I taught at uh, Jackson State University down in Mississippi, and it's one of the very few historically black universities. And I taught with colleagues who were part of the civil rights movement. So I learned very, very quickly where they were coming from and how they understood a, a world perspective. And I think that perspective is very, very valuable for us. You know, we have got to act together and we have got to act together locally. And when a local community, let's say, you know, the Washington Autism Society wants me to come to Seattle to do a series of photographs, I can work in relationship with them and I can come here and be able to do this much more effectively than if I tried to do this entirely on my own. You can make a difference. 
individually in each action you take, but you can also, through a group, have a much greater effect on change. And I do want to humanize it. I want every single person who's photographed and every single person who views it to feel connected to each other because it is about isolation. Um, one of the things that I try to do when I make these photographs is to talk to each person. Everybody sits there and tries to pose for the camera, and that's not what I'm looking for. What I want to do is connect with them. When I talk to young parents, I talk to them about my experience as a parent, and I ask them their experience as a parent. And just for that brief moment, you can see in their face they don't feel alone. It's the, oh my gosh, somebody else gets it. I'm not alone. My family doesn't always understand. Their families don't always understand, but we understand together because we are a family all, all in the same group. And that's what I'm trying to pull here, you know, by pulling these. Thanks. Personally, I'd love to see it like an, an Occupy movement where you had all your pictures. I think it'd be fabulous. Oh, oh yes. That, yeah, the idea is ultimately <laughs> to Occupy get Wall Street will occupy a park. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Just cover every, every space with these faces. You know, I mean, think about it. You walk into a museum, and every wall in a major museum in the country or internationally, all you see across all the walls in the museum are these faces just wrapping the space. There's no Renoir. There's no Cezanne. There's no Picassos. There's this. People are going to have to start asking themselves their own personal questions at that point. Yeah, I don't want it in a museum. I want it on every sidewalk. So. <laughs> I want people to not be able to avoid it. Thank you. Any billboard contractors? <laughs> You know, maybe we should look at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, let's let's shoot one. Can you still hear me? Yeah, let's shoot one to you, Michael. Um, what do you feel are some of the essentials in terms of the, um, transitioning to adulthood for someone on the spectrum, and how do you support that? Yep. So I'm gonna um, first react to something, then I'll go on to that. So I wanted to say that it's all about where you put your money and where you put your values, you know, like, and not, not to brag or anything, but Massachusetts has 97% of our people on health insurance, 4% below the national average unemployment rate. We're the most energy efficient state just announced today in the country, and we haven't cut education. So what does that mean? It means we don't have any more money than anyone else. It's where you put your money, so you need to demand that the money be spent, and we also have passed a autism, uh, uh, you know, insurance plan, so that they are, are your health insurance has to pay for autism services like ABA in Massachusetts. So that can, that's been done by a lot of other states. So you can you can do that in your state, and that's where you start. So you know, start switching the focus. And I forgot the question. Let's see, what was the question? <laughs> I'm a politician. And I'll give heart. you just a little time. Thanks for reacting, Michael. Yeah, <laughs> Um, no, I wanted to know what you felt was essential for okay, um, yes, someone sir. on the spectrum in, in terms of transitioning to adulthood. What are the essential skills? How okay. do you support that? So I said the other day that basically it's an inside-out job. They have to know themselves first, and that's a process. And I'm not going to go back over that. If you didn't hear it the other day, I guess you'll have to ask me afterwards. But I want to pick up from there and say um, and elaborate on the, the important things. So it's sensory integration which is the hidden one usually. People get the social thinking part and they get some of the executive functioning and the other skills like the academic and the career skills and the life skills, but they don't get the sensory one, which is very important because in order to maintain balance and be, and be present and focused and be able to participate, you have to take care of yourself, both you know, the uh, deep pressure, whatever you're using, and your diet and your sleep all those kind of sensory diets and stuff are really important. And has to be self-taught to the student to do things that they like. Like for me, it's swimming, and I love this hotel because of the pool. But uh, other people, you know, I've done it twice a day each day, and it makes me, gr it feels great. So, but for other people, it's other things. So you have to discover that for your child. And the social thinking part is really important for some of us. That's my Achilles heel. And I could put my foot in my mouth. If I was up here long enough, you would see my Asperger's would be showing. And as we say, and you would uh, see the whole full Monty. And, uh, uh, you yeah, because it comes out pretty quickly. But um, especially in the afternoons when my sensory diet's low, right? So you need to know when, you know, yourself. You need to learn about when you're low and what to do about it. I made sure I had water. I made sure I ate at the right time, blah, blah, blah. 
And then the social thinking part is really important. Learning perspective taking, how to read other people's emotions, feelings, understand that you're not the only one in the world, that there are other people who have valid emotions that are equal to yours. That was a hard thing for me to get. And, uh, and then, of course, the uh, executive functioning, which is both the academic and the, and, and the living part of it. So you could have someone who's really structured with their academics, but they can't keep their apartment or their bedroom clean at all. It's a disaster area. So they both affect each other. Or on the job, you know, your executive functioning skills are both cognitive and physical. You know, all of you to come here today or who are local, it's a Saturday. So you had to get up earlier. You had to maybe take the dog out earlier or ask someone else to take watch the kid or whatever you had to do. But you had to do a lot of things in your brain the night before to prepare. You take that for granted as a skill, just like we take for granted that people have perspective taking, which I don't. And um, you know, I have to rely on my social mentors. So those things are really important. Am I almost done? Give me oh, one minute. OK, there you go. I got a minute, she said. <laughs> well, she's late or you're early. But uh, <laughs> so then the other one would be um, uh, the uh, budgeting, banking, of course, and the uh, life skills. And, and the, uh, the career is most important, but it fits into all the other ones because you can't wait till they get out of college to have internships or community service. My saying is community service introduces you to yourself. You learn more about by giving to other per people about yourself than you do by trying to get a job. So don't dismiss any job at all or any community service. Get your kid involved now all the way through and they will learn social skills from that, they will learn everything from that. I'm on time. Thanks, Michael. Jalyn, um, I know that you participated in a White House summit. Could you tell us a little bit more about what was covered and what you came away with? It was a very interesting situation. It was called fairly quickly uh, because there had been a number of people that had approached the administration about issues with autism. And something that I find very interesting is that President Obama's uh, very dear friend and one of his uh, lifelong friends uh, that works in the White House and is a very capable individual uh, happens to have a son who is on the spectrum. So the president has grown with this family and understanding the needs and the issues on a very, very real basis. And uh, he encouraged his community outreach portion of the White House to put together the first ever uh, conference or summit on autism. And a lot of the uh, big names that you would recognize happen to be there, including Autism Speaks, but a number of people that are represented on something called um, the IAC, the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. Committee. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the IAC. And um, a number of people from there happen to be uh, involved in it and a number of other organizations and people that are trying to look forward to many different types of things. Although a number of those uh, individuals were involved in the research component and looking for cures, treatments, and, and the types of things, there were few, but a few, uh, that were looking toward adult issues and we were a fairly strong voice within that particular arena. Thanks, Jalyn. Um, actually, I've uh, done public comment in front of the IAC several times. So I guess what I would add to that for our audience is the purpose of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, and my daughter's presented there. Okay. Um, they're in charge of the uh, autism research agenda for our nation. Um, they're in charge of the federal dollars, and it's a, it's a committee that is represented both at a consumer level and you'll see parents on the committee. We have Stephen Shore, who you've seen, sits on the committee. Um, we also have Ari Nyman, he sits on the committee. He's also a self-advocate. So what they try to do is they bring together uh, people from all vectors who are dealing with autism to hammer out what do we feel are the most urgent needs in research. And every year they go through a strategic plan and they chart 
what the re where the research is going, what the most significant findings are. So that's why the ICC is focused on research. That's their charge. Um, also, I just want you to know that in terms of grassroots, back to what Christopher was saying and Michael, if you're looking for a place to insert yourself, we certainly could use your voice. Most people don't know about the IACC. Um, there's public comment all the time. If you ever get to DC, you should go to one of these meetings. They're talking about your kids. So um, that's the purpose of that committee. They put everything out on their website, and it affects you. So be a part of it. Thanks. OK, um, and thank you, Jalyn, for talking about the housing, because that's something ICC talks about, is the adult services need. And we need services addressed. Because while we need research, we also need to care take care of the population that's growing up and needs service now. So that is something that does need to be addressed. Um, let's go to Eric. Why don't you give me a reason? It seems like uh, my autism team already, I mean, how long has it been in existence? You just launched Four and a half months. Four and a half months, and you have over 10,000 people. So it seems like you sparked a catalyst. What do you think is driving that fast growth? Um, you know, I, 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 I want to read this quote. Someone posted on the, the the site yesterday, and I, and I think actually this summarizes it, and I was looking for a reason to be able to read this to you. Um, it's Sally Anderson, she's from California, and she wrote, I have to say, every time I log on to this amazing safe place, I learn a little more, give more than I thought I could give, and walk, a little more, walk with a little more strut in my stuff. So amazing to build relationships with others, as Temple put it so elegantly, different, not less, so true, love this place. And you know, like, that fires me up. That like totally gets me going to want to do more and more. But what I think it touches on is, number one, you don't feel alone, right? And so many people feel alone in this process. And it's just human instinct to want to find someone else who's been in your shoes, who's climbed this mountain, and can show you some hope, and, and you can learn from their experience. And, and so I think that's very common. Um, but I think the other thing is, you all build up so much expertise. It's like more than a full-time job. And I think there's a feeling of validation. You come on this site and you share your wisdom and people thank you for it. And they come back and they ask you questions. And I think that's a really good feeling. It validates what you've been doing for a long time. Um, and then finally, you know, I think all parents, any parents, constantly think about, am I doing enough for my child? And I think that's elevated in the autism world. And this is a place where you can just constantly kind of be keeping tabs on what are other people doing? What are they finding that's good? And it's an efficient way to do that on your own time. So I, I think, you know, we started this thinking the most important thing would be the team and the providers. But what we found is it's really the community. That's what's taking off. It's just people don't want to feel alone. They want to build those relationships and have community. So that's great. We'll go with where you go. I like that it's a safe place. Thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to bounce back to you, Christopher. Uh, you're an art major, or you teach the fine arts, mm -hmm. photography. What are you seeing? I know that for both my children, one typical, one um, on the spectrum, they both express art differently. One's studying architecture, one's going into multimedia. You have a daughter on the spectrum, and so on. What are you seeing in your arts classes in terms of the spectrum? Do you see more or less? Wow. <laughs> Okay, we all know the history of artists are eccentric, and, and I finally figured out why, right? Um, I started looking at all of my students and looking at all the students I'd had in the past, and, and I teach photography, which is a kind of a weird place to be in art because it's extremely analytical, extremely data-driven, and yet exceptionally creative and adaptive. You have to be able to do both of these things to be very, very successful at it. We, in the field, we call it, you know, craft and creativity. Um, and I even looked at the painters and the ceramists, and what I figured out was most of the people around me, including my colleagues, are not neurotypical in one way, shape, or form. In fact, the only people who are neurotypical are usually the business majors who come in and do photo one. Yeah. And that's about it. So it's this haven. And one of the things, I want, I'm going to make a plug for education here, and curriculum development, one of the things that I would love to see happen is that the education programs come into the visual arts and they watch how we teach our students. It's very one-on-one, -on -one. it's very personal. I know every single one of my students personally. 
I know their quirks. I know their nuances. I know how to make them flinch. I know how to make them smile. I get to understand who they are. And that process of learning is really critical to developing a full person, not just a visual artist, but a full person. And everyone has different skills, and everyone has different deficiencies. Um, one of my opening statements, the beginning of class first day is you know, about disability, that if you have a disability, if you have a learning disability, please come and tell me. Because I don't think that there's a ceiling. I don't think there's a wall that stops us. Part of my job is to help people find the hole in that wall, go over it, go through it, go around it. I mean, literally, if I have to punch a hole through it with them, we have to get them beyond the fear, beyond that point of what most people consider failure. And the comment was made yesterday about the adaptive idea of failure. Failure is not bad. In fact, failure is a fabulous learning tool. And that's a huge mistake most people come at with art. Art has massive failure. And you've got to learn to love it. And it has massive success. And you've got to learn to love it. And you've got to learn to love life. And that's what that's all about. Great. Thank I don't you. think I answered your question, though. <laughs> you did in the beginning, but it's great that you can riff, you know? <laughs> it's allowed. Um, Michael, I wanted to ask you a question because you're working with college students. And I don't know how many parents know, I hope you know, um, my daughter's in college, and when we transition from a public school setting, you no longer have IEPs. You convert to something called 504. Can I just get a show of hands of who's aware of that, that you're under kind of a different system? And how many are aware that that looks really different from an IEP, that you lose a lot of different supports, right? So one of the goals I had when I would talk to parents and advocate for their kids is when you hit high school, you need to start kind of really critically looking at that and weaning your, your kids off the supports that weren't going to exist and give them self-sufficiency once they left that high school setting. And where that wasn't possible, um, you're, how were you going to create those supports? But now I'm seeing some movement in our state and perhaps in others, maybe you can comment on it, where there are starting to be discussions around 504 being more supportive where it might include some more um, IDEA type of structure to better support the incoming population. Um, tell, me, tell me what you're seeing and, and your thoughts on uh, how we're going to support this population as they hit college and need more support than 504 can offer. Okay, so, um, so I'll tell you something a little bit about us, what, how we do it, and then I think that'll translate. First of all, we do have high school summer programs at all of our sites for two weeks during the summer, and what we try to do with those is First of all, the primary purpose is to have fun. This is a safe group, 12 students only we take, and they're always full by January for, at the latest probably, especially the ones out west here. And uh, they come to UC Berkeley or in schools like that, and we have our staff there. And I, I've done it and gone in the dorm myself with them the first year. And, um, and then we try to teach a little bit of our curriculum, a little bit of social thinking, a little bit of executive functioning. But the primary purpose is that they have fun, and then there's... They do a person-centered plan, is what we call it, which is at the sort of the opposite of what you do in an IEP. IEP is where they sit there and you tell all the professionals, tell them what their life is going to be and what you're going to do to them. So this is changing the locus of control from external to internal. What do they want to do? And then they take charge. So they bring their little thumb drive with their pictures, their videos, their music on it, and then they create a PowerPoint. Uh, which is going to be uh, their five-year goals, three-year goals, six-month goals, and it's an area of transition to employment or, or college. And they put on there the social, the academic, the employment, the financial, the residential skills. They put them all on there, and they do this with our staff. And at the end of this two-week program, they sit and they watch it with popcorn, like the movies in the evening. And I tell you, that one thing by itself, if they're a visual learner like I am, if I watch 11 other people's PowerPoints with their music and pictures and all their plans for the future, my whole horizons would be changed instantly because I'd be saying, oh, I didn't think of doing that. Look at what that kid's doing. Wow. And he's wanted to do that. And, and the possibilities just open up. And if you can visualize it, it can happen. You're 50% you're there already. When you, people tell me I'm a visionary because I envision these things for our programs and I just do them. I'm not afraid to do them. And, and so when you visualize it, you automatically bring all the power and stuff to you slowly. 
and it's, you can't be pie in the sky, but you have to be in reality. But so that's what we do in our program. We do a power, we do person-centered planning, which allows the student, and that's what guides their program. And, and so the parents come on the parent weekend, which was just yesterday in Long Beach, on Friday, I guess, and they had um, the parents come and they present these PowerPoints to them. The student stands up like we are, presenting it to his parents about his goals, what he wants for the future, who he's gonna be, uh, how he's gonna get there, who he's gonna partner up with, who he's gonna form alliances with, who's gonna help him on the staff, and how he's gonna get where he wants to go. And I'll talk more about it next time I get on here, so I can, <laughs> but I can't finish it, my thought right now. Thanks, Michael. Actually, I, I think I'm just gonna throw this one out to all of you, because I've heard you all mention education. Um, Chris, why don't we start with you? And Larry, did you want to say something first? Yeah. Real quick, for, for the rest of the world, um, to see uh, Chris's uh, photographs, um, Steve's actually going to be panning uh, to your photographs right now. Thanks, Larry. So the question, I just want to repeat it really quickly. What kind of supports, you're an educator, um, you're probably familiar with 504 and some of the differences in IDA and 504. What, where do you think the push needs to be? Do we need to expand 504? What are the answers? Because um, there are supports that are needed that, and our kids, some kids fall through the cracks. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I, I do actually think the 504 needs to be expanded. I think it needs to be more sensitive. I think it needs to be more focused. And the other side of it, which is separate from legislation, is that at the university level, I think we as the professorate need to become more aware. We choose to go into education because we consider ourselves lifelong learners. And yet, it's really tough to have you know an autistic kid in your class. I've had several fully autistic children. In fact, one uh, I recruited here from Seattle, spectacular artist. Um, her learning difficulties were really a challenge. And we have to be willing to stand up you know, and face those challenges with them and to be a partner with them. So it's more than just the legislation that has to happen, but it's each individual teacher has to stand up for each individual student. Now, I teach classes that max out at 20 students, okay? That's easy for me to do. But the professor who sits there with 300 students in a lecture class, that's almost impossible to do. And so again, some of the structure and the understanding about how higher, higher education works has to change also. So if you want your adult child who's in college to be successful, you have to go and you have to work with the administration to lower those numbers. And in fact, it, with budget cuts, those numbers are increasing. We're being forced to take on more students. We're being forced to take on more classes. I'm at a research school, so most of my employment is actually based on the research that I produce, not on the teaching. That's most of my evaluation. And that's a really tough paradigm to try to balance out because I'm also an exceptionally committed teacher to the each individual that's in my class. So, you know, again, some of it is challenge ourselves and challenge your friends and your colleagues who are up there, who are teachers, and then pat them on the back because they've got a really, really tough job, you know. Thanks. Jalen, do you want to add to this? One of the huge areas that we're working on is with many universities across the country and trying to um, instilled within the schools of education a couple of different components. One is to look at helping develop professions within this whole arena for individuals to have careers where they are engaged with our children and to look at different types of career possibilities within that educational arena. This is job creation right now. This should be a buzzword. Do we need family coordinators that can help understand what the community is to be able to waltz families through things. I don't know of any curriculum in the country that is educating people to be able to do that. We have social workers for other types of things, but to help with this particular arena, I know I could have benefited from that, especially when Madison was going through his crisis. Uh, and looking at career development uh, in education. Uh, so when somebody is a care provider, that they may see that they could become a manager, a director, 
teacher, uh, um, a different type of a, a tutor, any one of a number of different types of things within that arena of education, as well as looking at continuing education for the non-typical learners. Now, some people may do well with the academic environment in college. My son is not. But my son would do very well with having classes that would stimulate his interest and increase his ability so he would be a stronger, more capable person in 10 years than he is right now, and making fewer demands on society at the same time. Uh, so I think we need to look at different types of education and that we need to get out of a particular mode and look at different approaches. Uh, we have people with minds that are absolutely wonderful, but they should challenge us to look outside of the box as well, especially within the field of education. Thanks so much. I'm going to toss one over here to you, Eric. Um, I had a question now. Your, my autism team is primarily for parents, right? Mm -hmm. I know that when we were gathering resources for our parents and, and pushing it out, we went out and we actually visited all our professionals mm. to see if they yes. kind of passed snuff to us. I imagine you're going to get approached by professionals who say, hey, I want to, I want to be up on there. Right. How are you going to handle that? That's a really good point. Um, how many providers in here? A fair amount of you. Um, the site certainly is open and part of the community are the providers. We likely already have you listed on the website, but we don't know anything about you. We just know your name, title, and address. And what you can do is go to, the, go to my autism team and search for yourself. And if you're not there, um, you can add yourself for free. And you can also quote, claim the business. It's a little button you press where you say, I'm the owner or I'm the provider. And you can write a message you know, from you and say, here's, here's what I focus on, here's my skill set, here's my interests. Because what's critical in, in you know, that part of the mission we have to help people find the best providers around to help them is that they hear from you. And oh, by the way, you know, if, if you've signed on and you're part of the community, you can also answer questions from others. Um, you can, you know, people can post on your wall and it's up to you whether you, whether you post back. But you are, I guess what I'm saying, a full-fledged member of this community. And the more data you add to your profile, um, the more information there is for the community. And also just, you know, some free SEO or search engine optimization advice. The more data you put on your page, your profile page, the more Google's likely to index it so that people can find you. I love how internet savvy you are. That's spoken like a true software engineer. <laughs> oh, I'm not the engineer. Oh, you're not the engineer. Designer. OK. <laughs> OK. Um, Michael, I wanted you to talk about some of our um, teens and how, as parents and educators, we have educators in here, how do we prepare our teens for those uh, next steps into adulthood, not necessarily into college, but as a whole, how do we, how do we support their transition? Okay, and before I do that again, I would like to answer the last question more fully, fully, which is things that you can do. Social think these are on campus. Social thinking groups, social mentors is something we do, which is really good. Uh, signed access to, the, to talk to professors. Our staff can talk to the professors, and that helps a lot. Advanced registration, and a lot of colleges will do that. Uh, dedicated dorms, a lot of times they have that, and you can look for those. Advanced uh, advising services, and that's something they don't have, but they could do. Specialized classes in relationship development, theory of mind, ex executive functioning, et cetera. And so that's just some of the stuff I wanted to add to that dialogue. But as far as preparing your team, um, the, uh, the best thing you can do is start early to do all the little things. Like I said yesterday, don't take for granted the simple things like letting them take their meds themselves letting them track their meds, learning how to call and renew their prescription. Uh, all, all the life skills, obviously, but cooking a meal for you. I know it sounds ridiculous to have a junior high student shop and cook a whole meal for the family. It makes a big difference when you get down the line. So you're better off to go through the pain of dealing with that now than trying to wait till the later. The more they get used to doing these things, if they, if they have trouble with transitions or transportation, take them to a mall, let them loose with their cell phone, and track them, and then make them come back to you 15 minutes later and find you. You know, start doing the little things like that. Put them on a bus and meet them on the other end. You know, do these things, be, uh, because if you don't do them now, you're gonna, you're gonna be sorry. 
laundry is just the staple. You have, they have to do laundry. They have to know to take it out of the dryer, put it right on hangers. That's the deal, right? So it works for me. Then you don't have to fold them. You just put them right up and they stay unwrinkled. They don't look like they came out of a Cracker Jacks box when they're coming to, we have our students show up looking like hell, you know? We have to send them. <laughs> but uh, all those things, all those little things uh, from, uh, you know, dealing with the mailman or the landlord, the utility bills, everything that is complex so you can't start soon enough with all of that they need to be prepped from the beginning to understand it self-advocacy we talked about yesterday i didn't get any high signs so i'm going to keep going um the <laughs> unless she's sleeping on a job but <laughs> we're really good on time just keep going okay so uh the uh okay, don't do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can go michael now i've lost my train of thought but uh all those things that are really necessary to prepping them in the community, uh, letting them have a little community service anywhere where they're helping someone, you know, is really important because it leads to their self-esteem, their confidence in dealing with the world outside of you. I was talking to the guy, the platypus guy down there again. I said, this is great what you're doing with your son, teaching him these skills, but you've got to have him with other people. You've got to have him out of the house doing other things. Like now, he's 19, you know, get him out there. I'll pass. <laughs> Michael, you know, if you really have more to say, then you don't have to, like, make it up the next time. Are you sure? Okay, super. I just want to say really selfishly as a parent, Michael's totally right. Um, we started teaching my daughter um, life skills very early in the game because she was part of Montessori. And two years ago, as Larry knows, I broke my ankle, and I was laid up for six weeks. Let me tell you really selfishly, it was really nice not to get the canned soup and stuff because I taught my daughter how to cook. And for six weeks, I relied on both my daughters to do the laundry and do the cooking and that sort of thing because life happens. You could break an ankle. It's not necessarily about them going out into the world. You could have something hit your family dynamic that requires them to be more self-sufficient. So use every opportunity you have in daily life and take advantage of your schools. Um, my daughter's graduating from the 18 to 21 year old program in public school and that's meant to be a transition but three years isn't enough. You can't address it in three years. It really starts early and it really starts at home. So thank you Michael for expressing that so nicely. All right. Jalen, I wanted you to go in a little bit more into, you know, you talked about how we're going to have to think outside the box to solve some of the housing issues. And I really liked the ideas of, you know, parents grouping together, not necessarily looking toward agencies, but creating answers to our own problems. We can't wait. Let's just get down to it. Are there models that you're looking at that you can maybe, that we could also look at that are on the internet or, you know, resources that we could look at and go, you know, if I tweak that a little bit, maybe I can make that go here? One of the things that we would like to do is solicit your input into things that you're seeing that happen to be working. Uh, there are some things that we have on our website. Uh, there are some things that I would like to mention that you can start doing and looking at in your community and looking outside of the box. You can talk to your police departments and talk to them and say, what, what do you know about this population as in comparison to somebody who's on methamphetamines? If you're stopping somebody and they're non-compliant, they're not making eye contact, and they may not answer your questions, are they on drugs? Or has someone been separated or have fled from home or their environment? And uh, does it mandate uh, tasing? You know, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked. Uh, Madison uh, left... Um, uh, our home one time and uh, he wanted to go over to a pharmacy and get something and luckily there was a, a police officer whose wife had been working with a family who uh, had an autistic child he recognized the situation and instead of confronting this 20 year old he observed for a moment and looked at the situation and summed things up and instead of getting a taser, he got a teddy bear for my son. And he handed it to Madison, and he said, you know, we've got to look for your mom and dad. Would you mind uh, hopping in the back of the car, and you'll be safe, and uh, I see you're barefoot, and this would be, be good. 
And so the officer was wonderful. Now we do have a caution on the other side. There could have been somebody that wasn't a good guy that could have asked Madison to get in the back seat too. And we need to be aware in communities and make communities aware of that aspect. Uh, we also can approach our hospitals and say, is there a particular cubicle in the emergency room, uh, if I bring my child in, that doesn't have the bright lights, that maybe we're not listening to the sirens and seeing the flashing lights and gurneys being whisked down the hall and changing gowns being thrown at our child and say, all right, if we're identified, can we have a little bit quieter place so the medical outcome of whatever this emergency is, even if it's the flu and we are having to check blood pressure or whatever, can be better. So it's out of the box thinking about how we can educate others. Maybe going to a movie theater and saying, would you mind if on a Saturday morning we had a movie shown within our community and it didn't make any difference? whether the people in there were noisy or not, but a place where people can, can go and enjoy themselves. There's a lot of things that we can look at within our community. We do have some recommendations on our website, and you can check that out with madisonhousefoundation.org. And I love the movie idea. You know, Autism Society is doing some of that. <laughs> so you might check with your local chapter where you can take your child to a movie, and they're fine. <laughs> I wanted to ask Chris a quick question. You, um, you're a teacher, but you're also on the spectrum. How does how do you feel autism impacts teaching, if at all, and your parenting? Hmm. Well, I think before I understood myself, going back to Michael's comment, um, I didn't understand myself for most of my life uh, until my daughter came along, and when she was born, she literally came out screaming. I mean, really screaming. And I thought, wow, she's frisky. You know, this is my girl. She's going to take on the world. I had no idea what I was looking at. And as time went by, and my mother-in-law, God bless her, accused my daughter of having autism. That's how I took it. I was, I was so angry. I was so angry. So terrified. I mean, we've all been there. And then finally, you know, it sort of set in, and we started pursuing every avenue we could to figure out what was going on. At the time, we were in Mississippi, um, <clears throat> and at that point in history, they were losing massive amounts of funding for autism support. I mean, like, there was none, absolutely none. It had gotten completely cut. Um, and working with Maddie and my daughter Madeline um, has taught me a very humbling issue about my own expectations, about my own assertions of what's right, what's wrong, about my own temperaments, about my own sensibilities, um, about the things that make me anxious and make me nervous and will set me off and, and create these Aspie events. You know, yep, same thing. I get up here long enough, you're gonna see it. Um, and that's made me a much softer teacher, a much more sensitive teacher, and it's a forced me to be aware and again, I think, I teach art. Again, it's about the individual. It's about the sensibilities. It's about people who are afraid to make this thing for really good reasons. They're putting their own hearts and their own souls on the wall. And you have to be softer. You have to be more sensitive. I cannot be just a bold-nosed drill sergeant professor. You know, I have an inclination to be that way. And I have to stop myself every day, and I have to spend the 10-minute drive psyching myself up to lecture. It's a performance. And I also have to psych myself up to understand I'm working with very sensitive individuals who I have to be aware of. I have to see their facial expressions. And it is a very enlightening process. And it, I think it's made me better as an artist, as a human being, as a teacher, as a father. Um, am I faulty? Absolutely. Am I broken? Absolutely. Do I revel in my brokenness? Absolutely. Because I'm a human being. And so is the person I'm dealing with. And just this last week, I don't, I'm assuming I have a couple minutes, I had a student who I had a conflict with because I had, I had maintained my schedule, maintained my schedule, maintained my schedule. A couple of crises had come up in my family. Couldn't show, I couldn't attend classes, schedule maintained. The student got mad because, yet again, I was throwing another assignment at them. And so instead of maintaining the schedule, I shifted it, which is hard for me to do. But I pushed it off two weeks. The entire class was thrilled. She was still mad. And so I sat down and we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And what I did was I talked to her about my own human experience. I talked to her about her human experience. And we came to terms with it. 
and I encouraged her. She's exceptionally strong, exceptionally talented, exceptionally driven, exceptionally timelined, and needed to be empowered. And again, I think Maddie's been part of that process. And am I growing? Yeah. It's a struggle every day. But it's good to know that. Thanks for sharing that. Michael, do you want to share some perspective as a parent and stressors? I was talking to a wonderful woman here in the second row this afternoon at my booth, and I was we were talking about uh, relationships with, you know, how do you maintain, uh, the st you know, get over the stress and everything when you have a learning disabled or Asperger's or autistic child. And I was telling her that you have to do a few things. One thing is you have to make sure that you have your, like the other, like the other day we talked about your couple's night out, you know, your, your night out together. You have to be vigilant about it. And, you know, and then the second thing would be you have time by yourself, each, each the father and the mother. And uh, any of you were here for the father's group the other night on Thursday night? That was awesome. And it just reminded me so much why men bury it. We think we're just going to be tough, you know, mothers, and we're just going to do it, you know, we're just going to do it. And what happens is these guys come home from work, and they don't know what the hell is happening with their kid. The wife has done all the research usually, and she's been at the school, she's done everything. And she's emotional mess probably. And he's coming home, and all he knows is that she's not the way she was when he married her. And, um, <laughs> and this is not fun. And he's frustrated because he's trying to go to work, and he doesn't understand his kid, and he doesn't relate to the kid. It's hard enough for most dads to relate to their kids in the limited time they have. So the problem is huge, and so that somehow if you get your husband to one of those support groups, it really makes a difference if he'll want to go. And then having time by himself, and then the tag team strategy. If you're whacked out, and you know, around dinner time, which is usually when people are whacked out, then you need to say, can I, let's do the tag team strategy. I'm tagging you, can you take this for an hour? And I'll just go for a walk to the park and come back and then I'll be ready to go. Or if the guy comes into the house, he needs to be able to say to his wife, I need a half hour just to get all this crap from work out of my brain. Just take a shower or sit and watch the news or catch up on the NBA or whatever the hell he wants to. I guess there won't be an NBA for a month or so. Great, but anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, that you have to be able to support each other, otherwise it's gonna go south quick. And, it, and the divorce rates for families on the spectrum are higher than the already bad divorce rates, right? They're much higher, especially, and dads don't get it at all. It, most times they don't really get it about what's going on. They just know that they don't relate to this kid. I was talking a little bit about my, my dad was an athlete and I was number eight out of nine in my family. And not to only not have time, but he thought I was a little wuss and sort of made that known because I was into art and other things that he was not interested in, which was hugely negative to me, even though I was oblivious to emotions and understanding of this till maybe I was when I was 30. You know, I didn't get it. It's like a toxic sponge where you absorb it, but you don't get it till later and then you become depressed and act out. So I think you have to be aware of all of these things and put those things first. Put those things first because a whacked out wife ain't gonna do any good for that kid, okay? Jalen, do you wanna like re react? As, are you a whacked out wife? <laughs> it depends on the day. <laughs> Sometimes the hour. I had no idea um, <laughs> the 24-7 situation and, and the demands. We were fortunate enough to find, two summers ago, a wonderful camp for um, autistic uh, teens and adults in upstate New York. And for the first time in 20 years, our son moved, er, went to camp. And on the way up, I started to equate things because I'm thinking, here he is, 20 years of age, and um, I have friends whose sons are, are leaving to go to Afghanistan, sons that are in college, sons that are making plans and looking toward graduate school. And I keep looking back at Madison in the car 
I'm thinking, here he is, and he is going to do one of the most terrifying things in his life, to be away from home and away from parents at the same time. Now, he had done one of the two things. He'd, we've traveled with him a bit. But this is the first time, and it was every bit as challenging for him and for me. I was a basket case. <laughs> You know, and I'm looking at him, and I'm trying to not be overly protective, but I'm understanding exactly what this is meaning to him. Because one thing we didn't really totally comprehend is he had no idea whether we were ever going to come back and get him. The second year, he went off to camp much happier because he knew we were going to pick him up. But the stress of a mother in trying to help do things, it, it really does get to you. And sometimes with all of the other things going on with our, our typical kids, and can you imagine in our household when we had an 80-year span and I had somebody with Alzheimer's and somebody with autism, two active kids, a husband in the middle of his career, and one of our best friends was on an NIH study for Alzheimer's and would come and spend upwards of two weeks at a time with us. Yeah, there were moments that I questioned my sanity. <laughs> so probably taking care of yourself is a good idea? A very good idea. And, and we did have an opportunity during that camp to have a chance to take a deep breath, and I didn't realize what the stress level had been until we had an opportunity to exhale. Right. So what does that have to do with support services? You have to be in a, a sane place to receive them, maybe. You have to take care of yourself. I want to, um, actually, Eric, you're probably going to be surprised that I bounce this to you, but you're an uncle, aren't you? I am. <laughs> Are you a whacked out uncle, or do you support so the parents can get a night out? Do you want to, what stressors have you seen? And are the stressors, I know, um, I don't know, you're gonna bring a different perspective to this. When my daughter was first diagnosed, many of my family members didn't understand it. Um, for some it was like, it's just a cold, isn't it? <laughs> type right. of thing, and they're gonna right. get over it or grow out of it, or it's taken some members in my family to, to realize this is a lifelong condition, it presents lifelong challenge. Um, people hop on that ride at different points, and it, it can negate support sometimes. Um, so give us your perspective. And do you feel stress as, a, as an uncle? Tell us the extended family part. You know, I, I think the uh, being woefully underqualified to answer this question, I think the best way I, I can, I can uh, address Give it, it is, is talk about what I, what I read parents sharing on our site. Um, every week I see a comment like, my mother-in-law said it's bad parenting. Or IEP meeting today. Uh, why does it always look like someone's staring daggers at you? Um, you know, one after another after another of things like this that I know these people are under tremendous stress and really good people who support public education forced to sue their school. And they hate that they're forced to sue their, sue their, their school. But that's what they have to do to, to like make people understand the issues they're going through. So those people are so unbelievably stressed that you know, it was actually a parent who told us, you guys should make flyers because I want to start putting them up in my pediatrician's office and in my school so that I can find other parents that I can connect with and have more than just my voice so that I'm not just the one person at the school committee meeting saying it needs to work like this. And so, like, all our great ideas come from, from you. We, we've done it. There's one in all of your bags, by the way, if you care to do that. So um, for me personally, um, I moved to California. My whole family lives in Massachusetts. Um, I love them dearly, but gosh, it works really well this way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're really not going to like my next question because I'm because <laughs> I'm going to throw. Hope you're not watching, Mom. <laughs> I'm going to throw another one at you. And you can you can pass because it is kind of a heavy question. But um, as parents, how many of uh, can I get some parent hands up? How many of your parents here? How many have kids who are young adults are really approaching it? How many of you done estate planning? Oh, not a lot of hands. None of us like to really talk about what happens when we're not here any longer to take care of our kids. And yet, our goal at the end of the day, I think everyone would agree, is making sure our kids are left well. For some of our kids, perhaps they'll be able to stand on their own. We look at successes like Michael. Christopher, Stephen Shore, 
And then we have kids who are more severely impacted for whom they're going to need more support than that. They're not going to be able to do that. You're an uncle. You could very well inherit a nephew. Are you prepared for that? And, and how? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I, I'm still. Are you up? To, are you going to step up? No, I, sorry. I'm still freaked out that my five-year-old girl sings Katy Perry tunes. I'm like, that is so inappropriate. But, but anyways, I, I, I think you know uh, when I was giving the demo, I, I, I searched for all the parents on the site who have kids who are now adults. And the stat I heard is that there are 500,000 kids with autism right now who in this decade are going to become 500,000 adults with autism. And you know, all those parents who are on there now are running into the same issues that they ran into when their child was eight and there were no <laughs> services. There's no services now and they literally are, I think I said something like, you know, cutting their way through the jungle to, to, to just educate people and demand certain services. And I think they're not relying you know, they'd like to rely on the government or the education system to do it, but they're also just realizing, well, I have to get this done in my lifetime. So they're trying to find other interesting partnerships and ways of doing that. I love the idea that Jaylen brought up of, you know, finding communities where families can buy into a condo and, a, and a, you know, maybe you have one person who can work with five people. I mean, that's just genius. And that's a great way of doing uh, a private, public type of combination. The reason we did this site Right? And, and you know, I, I'm asked a lot, um, how are you paying for this? And right now, we're paying for it with my other business, but we're going to have to pay for this. And, and I'm committed to keeping the site free. So that means I have three options. I could ask for donations, I could ask for a government grant, or I could try to figure out a way to monetize this site. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, if we go from 10,000 to 100,000 to a million parents, you get enough eyeballs on there, we can put advertising on it and support it via advertising. And in my experience, in tough times, you know, donations or government funding won't be there. We have to figure out another way to be self-sufficient. And I think that's probably true for a lot of these other cases as well. So uh, I don't know if I answered that one, but it's kind of how I broke it. It's really good avoidance, you know. And <laughs> parents who have children on the spectrum I'm really, not ready if, really if, know what if, that's if, all if about. My <laughs> if my teenage nephew uh, lands at my, my doorstep, well... I'll, I'll show them around San Francisco and stuff, but I, I would be seeking the help. I'd go onto my autism team and I'd search for parents near me. That's what I do. It's the same help we're getting. You know, nobody does it alone. So I really appreciate that you've created a place where we can put our team together. So thanks for allowing me to put you on the spot. So a couple of things I wanted to back up on. Larry kindly reminded me. Um, Jalyn had brought up something about safety. It's something that um, my chapter had set as a goal very early on, and, and uh, Larry reminded me, when we talk about safety and awareness in terms of law enforcement or first responders, we're actually talking about first responders. Um, Jalen, you, you put it so eloquently in terms of, um, is that child on drugs, or are they threatening, or, or whatnot? And this is a big problem. There have been children hurt by um, first responders because they perceived um, non-communication, non-verbal um, skills or posture, whatever, to be threatening versus this might be a person with a disability. And our kids have gotten hurt. My time's up. <laughs> so what I wanted to let you know is that Dennis DeBald is a, um, a former policeman. I don't think he's in the force anymore. He's a, an investigator. Um, he helped our chapter, and he actually has uh, an organization that does that. But he, he comes in, and he has a program that teaches first responders the difference between um, a person with a disability um, versus what's really threatening so that our kids don't inadvertently get hurt. It's a really difficult position for a first responder to be in to make that snap judgment of, is this person putting my life or any other life in danger versus... So this person needs support, and they communicate or um, are in the world a little differently than the rest of us. So if, if you're someone who's trying to bring about some of these changes, um, I want you to know about Dennis Sabal, because I think his work is very important. It's made a difference in our local community. And we all worry about safety of our kids, but they're not in our sight all the time. And some of our kids are runners. So when they run, we want to know that they're going to get a teddy bear. I thought that was a beautiful story. They're going to get a teddy bear and a ride home um, versus taste. 
Um, the other thing, <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, and I'm sorry, Larry put down the website. It's autismriskmanagement.com. That's where you're going to find Dennis DeBalt's information. And he's very generous with his time and resources. And I highly encourage you to try to find a way to bring him into your communities to make your first responders aware. We've taken it out to f our uh, firemen. We didn't stop at our police departments. We're now in the sheriff's office. So it keeps growing. <coughs> and it took us four years before we could get police officers to even say, oh yeah, it sounds like maybe we need that. And now we get calls from them. So it's well worth your while. The other thing I wanted to bring up that I know Jalen wants to add to is when I saw the very few hands come up for estate planning. You know, nothing's more certain than death and taxes, unfortunately. And estate planning for our children is really important because if you don't do it right, the resources that you may be stockpiling to leave behind, they may have to spend down. I'm not going to go into it a whole lot, but what we've done before at USAA, maybe it's time to do it again, um, is we've had attorneys up here that are that specialize in this very specific type of estate planning. We do have someone tomorrow. So I encourage you to come tomorrow to um, listen to our speaker on this. It's a very specific kind of estate planning. You need a specific educated attorney who knows how to do that. And I know Jillian wants to add on to that, but please don't put off estate planning. None of us get to choose when we leave this world, and we certainly want our children taken care of when it happens. Jillian. When we're working in this next election cycle, making our public officials aware of certain types of things, because right now parents are penalized when we want to bring forward some finances to uh, assist in the living situations of our children. Because our children have to basically be declared indigent uh, before they qualify for some of the governmental help. And then if they receive the wrong types of assistance or you know the color TV or the trip to go to the family wedding or a few different types of things that we would all like to have our children be able to afford and to participate in where possible, sometimes those things we're not allowed to do or that the monies can't exist or it can't be funneled in particular ways. So there's a lot of questions to ask and we need to make certain that as people are from, uh, formulating policies that parents who are able to and want to be able to do financial planning are not going to be penalized because they are in a position to help. And if parents are in a position to help, we are going to relax the drain on public dollars, which will mean that our services can go further and help more people. So there's a tremendous, wonderful ripple effect, but we've got to look at some of these nuances and not just let things go by. And these are things, too, that we may need to look into our state legislatures and to other types of policy. Thanks. I did not realize. Time flew. Um, so we're going to go through what I call our super lightning round. <laughs> I want you to summarize in one sentence right down the line the one thing that you want to leave our crowd with right now. Christopher, let's start with you. One sentence. Uh, okay, maybe two, but let's, right. let's move it. Okay. Everybody, quick favor. L take a look at the work on the wall. I want you to look there while I speak. I'm going to quote this. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build to um, a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. That was Bobby Kennedy. We need to put together, or pull together, uh, to be able to move forward. There's a lot of power in parents, and the good things that are happening are often coming about because of parents. And we need to look for more choice and better use of public and private funds. Okay, it's an inside job. Start now. Don't wait. Don't uh, get other people. Start to generalize the skills to other locations and other people. It, it can operate in your house really well, 
or she, but the problem is when they leave you, if they can't do it with other people in other places, that's going to be a problem. So you have to generalize right from the beginning. All skills have to be generalized. I think our main takeaway is you're not alone. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You have a lot to share, um, and I hope you'll tell lots of people about our site so that they all come on, join it, and share that information. Thank. We're literally okay. Really, really quick. Thirty seconds on Michael. We have had a loved one who has been assisted with a program that he has. It's unlike anything else in the country. Here is a tremendous person to learn from, and they have thought outside of the box and are helping in college education. I needed to mention that because I've seen with our loved one a huge and dramatic change because of the things that he has been doing. Thanks. Thanks.